Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's Wednesday morning, March 24th, and this is the Senate uh, Agricultural Committee. Um, we're uh, going to get started um, on a proposal this morning dealing with hemp and cannabis. And um, we have uh, Michelle Childs with us, our uh, legislative uh, draft person. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning. And uh, Kevin Ellis and uh, Pedro Lynn um, and, uh, and all the committee members. And I think we've all met uh, a week or so ago. And so I, um, I'll skip by the introductions of everyone and we'll get right uh, to the draft that uh, M Michelle, would you like to run through that draft that you sent us and sure. we'll go for okay, it? Okay, to share my screen. Are you guys okay with sharing the, with me sharing the screen? Some, some chairs don't like it because they don't, because you can't see everybody. Is this okay? Sure, as long as you don't take any more than that. Okay. No, no. <laughs> go ahead. Michelle. Okay, so great. So so what I have here is an amendment for, for discussion that addresses the issue of uh, cannabis establishments and dispensaries being able to purchase and process hemp under their cannabis establishment license or their dispensary license. So I know I don't have to give you, give you all the backstory. You know that all the hemp stuff is completely separate from the cannabis regulation. Um, so hemp is, is controlled by um, a chapter in Title VI and uh, the cannabis in Title VII. A completely separate process for licensing that we're, we're in uh, the midst of setting up. And so the first licenses are supposed to be issued next spring. And then the witnesses had brought an issue to you uh, around concern whether or not if someone is licensed under the new cannabis system, could they purchase hemp products um, for processing and inclusion in, in any cannabis products that they might be either manufacturing or selling. And so um, I know the witnesses had suggested uh, an amendment in the cannabis chapters uh, that would change the definition of cannabis. Um, right now, the definition of cannabis excludes hemp. And they were looking for kind of a, a, to kind of build on that exception and say, well, it doesn't include hemp except under certain conditions. And I have a reluctance to changing the definition of cannabis to include hemp because we've gone to great lengths to, you know, to date to kind of keep them clearly separate and make sure that we're not jeopardizing anything in terms of our uh, our hemp program, our hemp pilot program. And so I talked it over with Grady um, because he's the expert on hemp, and uh, and so I think we decided that the best approach to address this would be just to make an amendment within the cannabis chapter specifically authorizing those licensees to be able to uh, handle hemp. And so you have the, so what I drafted it as a potential amendment to S25 because that is on the floor this week, um, but you know, I just wasn't sure where it might go. So I just drafted it as an amendment, individual amendment. There's two sections. The first section, section 20, starting on line six. So this is just adding an exception there because there is already something in current law that says clearly that the cannabis chapters don't apply to the regulation of hemp. So I just did a little carve out there on line nine. And then you have a new section on section 21. And so this is adding section 870 to title seven. Um, and this is within the cannabis establishment chapter to say that hemp flour and biomass may be purchased and extracted by a cannabis, a cannabis establishment licensed pursuant to this chapter. And so those are the, the adult use licensees. And then, or a dispensary license pursuant to chapter 37. So the dispensaries are currently regulated in Title 18 
uh, Chapter 86, uh, and they're regulated by the Department of Public Safety. But one thing that's happening um, is that the they're uh, to move over to the Cannabis Control Board from DPS. Last year in Act 164, they had them moving over in March, but S25 moves them over earlier, moves them over July 1st. They will continue to operate under the, the Title 18 provisions till they switch over in March, so that doesn't change. But under the current scheme, under Title 18, dispensaries can um, purchase hemp and handle hemp under their existing statutory scheme. And so this is just that when the new one drops down in March, um, they would be able to do it similarly. Um, and so they can uh, uh, they can purchase and extract the, the flower and biomass as long as it was obtained from a hemp grower that's registered under our current program, um, or if they are registered or licensed in a state authorized to produce and sell hemp under federal law. And so my understanding in talking with Mike was that that's possible currently under our existing scheme for the hemp. And that, um, and what about the testing, Michelle? You, you know, the, the, is there reg? Have you built in regulations of um, of the testing to make sure that we aren't running over any limits? Uh, you know, for THC or any of that. Well, the thing here is that when you're talking about, we're talking just regulating here the. Can this is that cannabis establishment. So they're already authorized. Okay. We're trying, Mike and I are trying to silo it, right? So it's like, it's not changing anything with regard to who is registered under Title VI to grow hemp. This is just saying that if you are licensed under the new cannabis law, you can also um, be, uh, you can also work with hemp. And so, um, so it's, it, you know, I think it's permissible under the current law, but the witnesses would like some better clarity about that rather than leaving it up to the board. There is a provision in current law that requires the board to adopt rules regarding additives to cannabis products. Um, there's not much discussion of hemp in the existing cannabis uh, laws other than if you're a retailer that's going to be selling cannabis products and you also sell hemp products, you're supposed to clearly make, uh, label those as such in your in your retail store um, yep. so that consumers aren't confused about which product they're and you have to kind of keep them separate but that's really all that's addressed currently um, with regard to the hemp so I think it's permissible under current law but um, the witnesses and they can speak for themselves but they I think they're looking for um, for clarity on this at this point through legislation. So it's really, this is clarifying the law to make it very clear that it is uh, an allowable use. Yes. Yep. Yeah. But it's not changing anything with regard to your hemp program. Again, we didn't no. want to mess with that or jeopardize that by injecting the cannabis issue into the hemp program. Or um, it's not changing the cannabis uh, regs either, right? Uh, only it's clarifying the language that you can use hemp as an additive to cannabis. Yes, it's specifically authorizing that. It's silent on the matter in the current law, but has the board adopting rules with, with respect to additives. So it's totally permissible for it under the current scheme. But you know, there, I guess there is the possibility that the board could put forth something and say, they don't, you know, that, that a cannabis establishment couldn't be working with hemp. But I mean, I think that would be, that would be arguably tough for them to put forward because there are some specific do not combine cannabis with certain ingredients under the cannabis license scheme. So there's a specific prohibition against combining cannabis and alcohol or cannabis and nicotine. And that's- yeah in statute. So I think if there was, if the board was going to interpret it, that they could say you can't combine it with hemp, I think there's a strong argument to say, well, we would have said that in the legislation. Um, but, you know, there's there's no harm in, in articulating this specifically in statute. I'm just saying that if you didn't, I, I personally don't have a lot of concern. It wouldn't be addressed by the board, but I understand the industry, you know, wants more certainty about that. Yeah. 
Um, so page two, subsection B, uh, is that the like, cannabis establishments and dispensaries um, can obtain and process the hemp in the form of distillate or isolate, and all processed hemp derivatives shall be accompanied by a certificate of analysis showing potency levels for all those chemical compounds that I can't pronounce. <laughs> um, and that's modeled after uh, Illinois. And subsection C is uh, just kind of a cross-reference about the provision I spoke about, about the adoption of rules uh, with regard to additives. And that's it. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward. I'm hopeful that, the, that Pietro and Kevin might think that this will address their concerns if you're interested in moving forward. Yeah. Um uh, and are there any questions from committee members of Michelle at this point? If, uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, I, <clears throat> I have a question. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, Michelle, I, I'm I'm trying to get my head around this uh, because I and I heard you say that this is sort of already handled, and and I, you know, there's a lot of investment and energy that's gone into the hemp. And the CBD uh, business world uh, today in Vermont for the last several years, there's a lot of sort of pent up energy to go into the cannabis uh, THC world and and this explicit blending of them. I, I can't give you a good reason, but it, it does make me a little bit uneasy because I don't pretend I understand all of the ramifications and I'm not convinced there's a rush, but I want to just explore you sort of said, I don't think this is necessary. Um, <clears throat> and that's that's kind of my assumption. I mean, if, if somebody is growing or processing under the cannabis scheme, there's no part of the state that is checking up on what kind of cannabis plant you have, right? So, so uh, uh, a uh, cannabis producer could grow some CBD cannabis. Nobody cares about that, right? I mean, I, help me understand. I, I get that maybe it's a little not clear, but is there a pro what, what problem are we really aiming at? And the reason I ask is every time we talk about this on the floor and bring floor amendments, especially, it's it just, there's an, an unease and, and I got to be convinced that it's really worth it uh, before we take that on because everything is <laughs> just complicated. So Michelle, can you help me understand? You sort of said, I'm not sure this is necessary. Everybody wouldn't mind a little extra clarity maybe, but, but what, do we, what do you think, Michelle, this clarity brings? Um, if, does it make a real change? Or is it just simply uh, a little belts and suspenders? Um, you know, I think that what the uh, what the witnesses are looking to do, I think, is totally permissible under the existing statutory scheme and the way that I view how this would be working with the board and the adoption of rules. I would anticipate that this is all going to be a part of that and it would be a board decision. But if you want to be absolutely sure that that it's clear to the board that a cannabis establishment or dispensary can be handling hemp separate and apart, but do it under their, you know, but in it, it's not any kind of violation of their um, of their license under Title VII you know, it's, it's fine to certainly, you know, be very direct in that and include that in there. Um, so, you know, this was not a discussion as part of Act 164 last biennium around these two. And, and as you know, because you're always dealing with Mike and in, in your committee on the hemp issue, you know, they very, very separate issues intentionally. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're probably going to see, obviously, as the industry grows, more and more of a, of a blending of the two, you know, right? So people who are currently growing hemp are probably 
many of them are interested in converting to cannabis and obtaining a cannabis license. And maybe they would want to be registered under the hemp program and have a cannabis establishment license. But, you know, I don't know. That would be a question for Mike about whether or not that would jeopardize something under the hemp program. That's where the real, I think, concern is. But this is just talking about cannabis establishments having hemp. So, yeah. yeah. See, this is, and again, nobody is nailing this, but this is my concern that there, there clearly are people in the hemp world that are warming up to get into the cannabis world. That, that is, everybody understands that. But there are also people in the hemp world that are happy in the hemp world and don't, don't have any desire, I believe, to go into uh, cannabis. And, and I'm a little bit worried that this shift may be undermining them, those people, um, without us fully understanding it. So to the extent I'm expressing hesitancy, that's part of it. But anyway, thank you. Uh, Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, Senator Pearson's question prompted me to think about this as well. And I, I'm probably not gonna say this the right way, but this seems like a one-way street to me. In other words, if you are already having a cannabis license, you're asking for an additional ability to grow hemp, but those who only have a hemp license aren't are going to get that same sort of uh, flexibility in their world. And I'm wondering how many people are we talking about that need both licenses, if you will. But is, is there something in the law that says you can't have both licenses? There, I don't think there's anything in, there isn't anything in this bill or this draft that would prohibit going either way. I, I can't see. Um, Maybe I'm missing it, but there there isn't. I guess the question I would have, and it would be for for Mike. Unfortunately, I'm sorry I can't answer it. But is about you know the practical implications if you had someone who was growing both. Um, is that a concern in terms of the hemp program because of the federal rules around that and 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 what's required to be a part of that project. Um, I don't think that anything in amendment or in the statutory scheme um, jeopardizes that. Um, and so that's one of the things we wanted to be very clear about is we didn't want to mess with the hemp statutes because they're, you know, they're created in a way to, to make sure that you're in compliance with federal law. And so um, but I, I don't I don't know the answer to the question if somebody was growing hemp and then decided to apply for a, a, a cannabis cultivation license and then they were doing both, what their liability is with regard to the hemp and the federal program. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Hydra, did you have a question? I see your hand go up. You, you did, and I, I was hoping if the committee would allow it, or you, Mr. Chairman, would allow it, that, that I would be permitted to speak to the, the issue that Michelle rightly raised. And um, so, so look, uh, the concern here, and, and I think as a, again, remember, I'm a lawyer, and I work with courts in, in terms of statutory construction and application, and this is my fear. Um, if we were adding vitamin C, to cannabis, um, it would be an additive. And we wouldn't need to worry about any changes to the current statutory scheme. It's fine. What, what is different here is we are changing the nature of the CBD oil through the process and turning it into, as part of this combination with cannabis, into THC. And so it's I, it, quite literally, a court could easily conclude that is not an additive. That is a transformation of the CBD oil into something else. And, and so the distinction for me uh, is if, if we were just putting CBD oil into a cannabis product and say, look, CBD oil is healthy for you. So when you use the cannabis, you get these other health benefits. That would be one thing. 
But what we are proposing and the technology that exists allow us to use cannabis and CBD oil in combination and turn it into relatively pure THC. That's the, that's the gap that, that we're concerned about. And um, in trans, now let me transition for a moment to, to Michelle's draft, which I thought was excellent. And I think it does two things. It, it creates certainty around processing the CBD oil into THC and then puts it under the umbrella of the cannabis um, statutory scheme and the cannabis board. And I think that's all for the positive. But it does something else that I, I'm not sure um, I had considered. What, what it does is it expands the marketplace for hemp farmers because it grants an ability to process the hemp into THC, um, first making isolate or distillate and then later into um, THC. So hemp farmers in Vermont have a broader marketplace for their product. Um, so that, that was, um, Chairman Starr, that, that's what I wanted to raise. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Chris, do you, do you have a, an issue with timing? Uh, because that bill, um, that, that bills yeah. up this week and today's Wednesday. So I don't know if it's tomorrow. I think that bill comes up today. It's today. And, oh, and, it's uh, today. so, uh, yeah, <laughs> and we, and, uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I'm not enthusiastic. I, I, I'm, I can't articulate myself well because I'm not understanding this. And, and I, I guess if it were left to me, I would encourage our friends here to, to uh, work on this on the second half. Uh, this bill goes, you know, is only just getting started in our process. Um, I, 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 yeah, so, so, but, you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw down over this if the committee's interested. I, I, I'm just be honest and say I, I'm not understanding all the ramifications. This is a, a brand new industry. I think, frankly, it's why we set up a board to handle some of these more nuanced considerations. And and I, I'm not sure of the harm if this gets sorted out in year two of our um, markets. I mean, you talk over. Over the years, we talk about having a mature market, and it will take many years. You don't even see that in Massachusetts and other states that have been four or five years under under a tax and regulate scheme. So I, I'm not seeing the urgency, and I'm I'm a little uncomfortable acting quick. But that's just me. Um, you know, if committee. Well, is this is a a, a Senate bill, right? And so it's got to go to the House. Uh, I don't, Kevin, uh, have you talked with any, any House members uh, at all to see, you know, what their feeling is? Like, I don't know if, if this should be, you know, we haven't, in ag, we haven't dealt with cannabis really hardly at all, but we've dealt with the hemp. So I'm wondering, have you talked with, so I would expect this bill will go to judiciary on the House side. And I, I really haven't talked with any of them to see if they would take this proposal that we could, you know, I think we could send them a, a letter or whatever asking if they would please consider this because of its timeliness coming to us kind of late, uh, but, you know, it, it all makes sense to me, I, um, you know, about putting, being able to combine the products without having a lot of problems with the regulators and, and clarifying the language so you could do that. But if, I mean, we, this is only the second day, I guess, that we've really worked on this. What, what do you think about something like that, Kevin, politically working? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that's great. I don't want to put the uh, Senator Pearson in a difficult position, and I see. Why I'm, not? He gets a big box. I, <laughs> 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 um, and 
And we're, we're, you know, a letter to the House Judiciary would be great. Uh, our goal here was to get this issue on the table so it could be discussed. Um, and we're happy to go over to the House Judiciary Committee and introduce the issue with a little more deliberation um, and, see, and see what happens. I, I, you know, I, I think that, that works fine. Um, and I'm grateful to Michelle for putting, you know, putting her head on this and making, putting pen to paper. So, well, and it, it would all, also give us an opportunity to talk with Senator Sears in our Judiciary Committee, asking them, you know, to think about this. And Michelle, uh, of course, is in there probably about every day. Um, and, you know, it would give our whole side more opportunity uh, to get used to this. And, and if we could uh, support it over on the other side to some degree, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we could talk with Carolyn uh, in the Ag Committee uh, about where we are, you know, on this. We're late getting started, and but would ask that they would consider it and and Sears, uh, Senator Sears, if if we can get him to buy into this, he could talk with the House Judiciary Committee uh, as well. Yeah, it was Senator Sears that sent us over to you because uh, he was he was busy with racial equity and a lot of other issues. So um, that's what led us to you. And I would I'd love to get some advice about whether we should go talk to House Judiciary or House Ag first. Uh, we'll do both, whatever you want. Well, it's actually not House. Uh, it's House Government Operations. Oh. So Judiciary, now that cannabis, cannabis in Title Seven, Judiciary doesn't work on at all in the House. And okay. um, I think that's probably going to shift over in the Senate as well to be GovOps because um, they're still with the criminal and civil violation, you know, cannabis stuff. And so now that it's really just regulating an industry and setting up the agency, it's the GovOps committee. So it would be uh, Representative Copeland Hansis. And, um, and then if you wanted, uh, ag, you know, to to take a look at it, I decide and make a recommendation to House Government Operations on the issue. We'll do. Yeah. It. Um, so, what's the committee uh, committee agreeable with that? That um, that we would, um, I don't know, punt this over to, to the House and and uh, yeah, it. To me, it sounds like it's clarifying language. Uh, <clears throat> and if it would allow our hemp guys a little, one more sales outlet, uh, you know, their sales haven't been, it, uh, to this point, haven't been uh, that great. Uh, if it would allow uh, uh, an additional market for them, uh, I think it would be, it would be good. I don't think cannabis growers are going to want to grow hemp unless they've got plots of land lots lots of miles apart because of cross-pollination and stuff. I think they'd probably just as soon let the, farm, the hemp farmers grow the hemp and buy what they want to buy from them rather than, than fooling around... Uh, you know, growing hemp and growing cannabis. Um, so, um, so uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm uh, fully in support of your suggestion that we uh, allow the other body to uh, consider this. Yeah. Uh, and, and you guys are okay, I guess, Kevin. Uh, I think, I think uh, you've got a pretty good crew to work with there on in government ops on the other side um, yeah. so, so that uh, should should move along and Michelle's already done the heavy lifting so that's good um, so that's that's what we will do and uh, and wish you well and uh, and hopefully we can 
get this done for you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the to the committee. Thank you, yeah. everybody. Have, have a great day. Yeah, and thank you. Um, so, uh, Linda, uh, what do we got up uh, next? At 10 o'clock, Michael's going to come in and uh, walk you through H434. Um, so we um, we haven't got anything until 10. Um, what about um, our our bills that we've got 100 coming up uh, today and uh, both of them. And 102. And 102. Uh, so uh, is Brian Brian Campion's going to offer the the amendment from education, and we're all uh, on board with that. I know uh, Brian, you had a question on the process. Yeah, and actually, I've just received emails that indicate that S100 is going to be asked to be passed over today. Um, we have apparently some uh, folks that are getting real nervous about the uh, impact on local school budget. So that, I just got that from uh, from one of the other senators. It says uh, Senator Campion agrees this is a big issue and the bill will be passed over today. Oh shit! That uh, that's really bad. Um, yeah, I, I was talking with Brian. Uh, earlier uh, before you guys all got on and we're still on youtube by the way senator yeah that's fine i hope it's wired <laughs> into every superintendent's office in the state um but you know we spend if you think about it, 1600 million dollar bills on education and we can't afford to take 25 of those, those and feed the kids. I mean, it's like having, if one of us had $1,600 in our pocket and we're at the grocery store quivering over whether we should spend $25 on food. I mean, it's ridiculous that uh, that's even a, an issue in, in the system. And uh, my own little district is getting over 10 million new dollars on top of that to, to spend on something in the next three or four years. I mean, the whole issue uh, is, is baloney as far as I'm concerned. It's, uh, and I think it's time that we get our we get a shot in the spine and stand up and take that crew on. Anytime they run short of money, they certainly know where to come and ask for more. And uh, and what we have two school budgets that didn't pass this last year at, at town meeting. So what they're doing is blowing smoke and I don't think school board members or the superintendents have even read the bill. Uh, you know, uh, we've got, if it, if it puts them over the spending limits, that's in there to protect them. I mean, we, we did a heck of a job putting a, a system together to make sure our children get fed properly without a, without a, I mean, I, I don't know what they think, but anyways, uh, Brian. Yeah, so from what I'm gathering, it's one line in the bill that's creating most of the issue. And I think it's in Chris's part of the bill. And the line says, to the extent that costs are not reimbursed through federal or state funds or other sources, the cost of making available school lunches and breakfasts shall be borne by school districts. So. That's where they're coming down and saying, uh, 
you know, if, if the state doesn't want to pony up the money and the feds don't want to pony up the money, it's going to fall on the local school districts to do that. And um, I think that's the one that's causing the most heartache. Um, yeah, the other thing, you know, so do we agree that, that we have about 280 schools, something like yeah. that, is that what we've heard, and 70 of them? So we really have 210 schools left. And if you well, take 20, 70, 70 to 80, Chris. Sure. But let's let's say there's 210 schools and they've got us they've got to come up with the $25 million and there's 210 of them. It's it's one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. I mean, it's 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 you know, so if you're a superintendent, maybe you got four or five of those. It's in five years after, I mean, it really, I think you're right, Mr. Chair, that, that you know, somebody's sent out provocative emails. Well, you know not... where it came, it came from the executive director of the three groups. Last week, we got that nasty letter um, saying that we were all messed up. Well, then that got sent to all the school districts and and of course the school districts uh i doubt if they saw the bill but they got that letter pushing them to push us well tough luck as far as i'm concerned well and and you know we're not oblivious to the pressure this means we 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 just haven't pinned it down exactly how we do it but we've talked about helping them make the transition. We've talked about the federal dollars. We know the, the sales tax is performing well. So the Ed Fund, you know, there's no reason to think this is a direct hit to property tax. There are a lot of variables here. Um, well, and anyway. we, aren't, we aren't completely broke. And I would expect when, when the committee starts dealing with the 22 budget, that some of that, uh, some of that cost will get picked up by us, but uh, you know, uh, hell, we got to work through the system and work work with the system. And uh, you know, I I don't know, but I I hope that we stick to our guns uh, and and move forward. Uh, you know, three. Three committees voted the bill out unanimous, and and that that says quite a bit. So, anyways, uh, so we're going to we're going to pass over that, uh, I guess today. Uh, That's and, the word uh, I got. Gonna... Yeah. Can we talk about some other scheduling things? Just yeah. Um, so maybe Linda could take us offline.